Yeah. All right. Uh, should we get started? Sure. All right. Cool. Um, my name is Jeremy Schwartz. I run uh, World Possible. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, we kind of manage what's called the Rachel Project, uh, which has turned into a collaborative effort to deliver um, copies of websites to communities that lack internet access. So um, part of this presentation is probably less technical than most people are used to around here, but um, we'll go ahead and we'll go through it. And um, what our main mission is here is to provide a quality educational opportunity to kids, what used to be around the world, uh, where we knew that they didn't have Internet access. And over the last year or so, um, we found that here in the United States, this is a much larger problem than we ever imagined also. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the hardware and focus a little more on the technical side of what we do and how you can replicate what we do in your community, um, and then tell you a little bit about our international program as well. Um, that's a fluff marketing piece. But what the, the problem that we're addressing right now is that there's uh, just over 4.2 billion people around the world who don't have access to the Internet. Um, that presents all sorts of challenges, the largest of which is that these people generally also lack uh, a quality education and educational opportunity that, that we've taken for granted for many, many years. So um, the, the reason those 4.2 billion people are not online is, is not just there's no Internet access in their community. There's uh, a McKinsey study that was just done early last year, and it said, why aren't people using the Internet? Um, and you can break it down into two large buckets, the tangible and intangible buckets. Um, tangible buckets are things like infrastructure. There is no Internet in their community. Um, things like incomes, they can't afford to use the Internet in their community, as well as intangible things like they have no incentives, no reason to use the Internet in their community. They don't know what it's going to do for them. Um, and the more basic things like ability, and that, that generally comes down to illiteracy, um, which prevents people from getting on computers and, and from understanding what they're looking at. Um, when we talk about the tangible reasons people don't have Internet, a lot of this goes to international backhaul channels, uh, landlocked countries that have to negotiate agreements, and this is when you're talking about most of Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, East Africa. There is literally like one large backhaul cable that connects most of West Africa to the rest of the Internet world. So uh, we started in Sierra Leone. We were there for about three weeks, and a Chinese ship dropped an anchor on the one cable that provided Internet access to East Africa. So we were without Internet for seven days. And this is just some of the challenges that we see in the developing world and why people don't have access to the, the tangible parts of, of Internet access. And at any point during this, please stop me. It's a small group. Uh, we can chat and talk at any of these. Um, so what World Possible has done is we started creating copies of websites so that people can download them and take them with them. And what we've started with is the open source community, the Creative Commons licensed content, which you'll see here is a small selection of our content. And I'll get into a little bit more about how we do this and what it um, enables. But things like the Khan Academy, Khan Medicine, um, Practical Action, which helps people build in a rural environment clean water supply, small fishing ponds, um, all the way through to things that you and I use every day, like Wikipedia. Um, Project Gutenberg is the great books of the world. There's some scratch and computer programming. And so what we're building is the largest collection of websites that you can go and download and take with you. So you can throw them on a computer, you can throw them on a tablet. Or what we've got sitting around here now is we have these little servers. And what I'll do is I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. And these are large collections of websites as they existed at a point in time, put on one of these little boxes. And you can plug these boxes in anywhere in the world and provide access to this set of content for a community that would otherwise lack Internet access. Um, and so that's, you know, we started in Guatemala. We did a lot of work in East Africa. And now our largest actual customer, we've started selling these is the Department of Juvenile Justice and the Department of Corrections here in the U.S. So we're in 13 states now running educational programming in the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, and we're in two federal facilities. So they bifurcate between kids who are 18 and under, and actually even in some cases 24 and under, who are required to get a uh, five-hour educational opportunity. You're sitting in a youth correctional facility in Oregon, and you have one teacher who's supposed to be giving this education to kids that range anywhere from 13 to 24. And they've been looking at technology as a way to, to help bridge this gap where I can't teach all of these kids at once. And that's where Rachel has come in. So we are now in every youth correctional facility in Oregon, which is 27 facilities. And they have two servers in each facility. Um, and we've rolled that same program out to 12 other states now. So again, this is the infrastructure piece for people who don't have internet. We're trying to build, um, 
hold on, sorry. We're trying to build a small slice of the Internet for them to use. Um, the larger piece, um, and I think I've got two of them sitting around here. This was recently designed by Intel. You can even hold that up. This is a, a larger device that has 500 gigabytes of storage, which allows us to store all of the Khan Academy, all of TED Video Talks, all of Radiolab, all of Wikipedia, and about 45 other websites um, on it. And so I don't know if either of those are flashing and turned on, but we can go through a, a brief demonstration. This is, okay. So if anyone wants to go through a brief demonstration or talk about the tech specs here, this is a de device designed by Intel. Uh, they just came out with it about four years ago. They call it the CAP or Content Access Point. Um, we have redesigned it and preloaded it with all of our websites, and we actually now sell this device. And this is a device that we sell mostly into the prison system, uh, but we also have these devices running with our staff in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, and Guatemala, where we actually have a physical presence. So it's got Wi-Fi. It goes all the way back to Wi-Fi A, all the way through now AC. So there's a wide range of availabilities to compare with old hardware that exists in the developing world. Uh, 329, and that gives us about 60 bucks uh, margin on top of what we buy them for from um, Intel from China. Um, and then there's an 8 gigabyte EMMC, which runs all of the operating system and some of the exercises inside it, and then the large content storage, which can be expanded to any size we want, uh, but 500 gigabytes is about where we've sat so far. Runs for five hours of battery life on its own. So um, like in the Department of Corrections, if you have someone in juvenile detention and you can't have them taking classes with the rest of the students, you can just walk this over to the solitary confinement ward and they can turn this on and they can give someone something to do for five hours. They can learn computer programming. They can learn math. They can learn science. Um, Intel Atom processor, two gigabytes of RAM, and we've been working with Intel on a second generation of this particular product to give us a little more power. So if anyone, um, we also have this Raspberry Pi version, um, and that's the smaller box sitting up there. I don't, I'm assuming people know what a Raspberry Pi is here. <laughs> that's a pretty safe bet. Um, if you have a Raspberry Pi, all of the instructions are online for how to build this yourself. You can go online and download a 64 gigabyte image, and that has the operating system as well as the content. Uh, and you can just turn this on, and you can be connecting to uh, old websites. Uh, just like anyone else around the world. So it's a free project. Um, if people want to try it now, there should be a couple Wi-Fi signals running. I don't know exactly what I turned on. I wasn't expecting as many people to show up all at once. But there's a signal RPI, which you'd like to connect to one of the Rachel Pi units that's plugged in. Uh, there's a signal Rachel, which should be one of the two CAP units. And then there's a signal Rachel demo, which is the other of the two CAP units. Uh, and if you're on an Apple device, I don't take any credit for what you're doing. They like, like to ping back on their captive portal. You can get it done. Um, but Apple, Apple devices, you probably have to start in airplane mode, and then you have to open your web, you have to connect to this signal, and then open your web browser. And then from there, you can either navigate to my.content, or you can navigate to an IP address that I can throw up. But Apple devices are notorious for their dislike of the system. Um, and that's because they're pinging back to Apple whenever you get connected to Wi-Fi and there's no internet with these devices. So uh, I use them too. Is anyone connected to any of these systems yet with any success? Or should I demonstrate this? Okay. So sometimes these signals um, get over. There's no Wi-Fi interference built into these because we're in places that don't have Wi-Fi already enabled. So we're in a big conference center. It's especially bad because scale will override our, our Wi-Fi system. But yeah. Okay. So if you open your web browser, you can, t on the RPI, RPI is a little different. It's 10.10.10.10 uh, in Google Chrome or Safari or whatever it is that you're using. Um, and that'll pull up your, your content set there. I'm wondering if I can. There we go. Let me see if I'm on that one also. Okay, so this is, we're, we're both connected to Rachel Pye, which is what the young lady in back is connected to. That has a 64 gigabyte micro SD card inside it. Um, and what you'll see here is, is these are websites pretty much as they existed in a point in time. So this is Wikipedia for schools. This is a highly used resource, so we update this about every three months. So you can come in every three months and you can get the newest version of Wikipedia for schools. 
The Khan Academy by K.A. Light is a very cool system um, that takes the Khan Academy offline. It's produced by the Foundation for Learning Equality, and this gives kids the actual ability to log in, create a student profile, and go through all of their math and science and computer science learning that they want. So once you've created a login, you can click you know, Learn, Math, and you go through each one of these sections depending on where you are. And this is from the very most basic, counting with small numbers. We'll start a Salcon video. And then so he's teaching them how to count seven squirrels. And then at the same time, when you're done watching that video, it'll click you over to an exercise. And then it'll ask you to put 10 apples in the box. So this is totally offline. You can do this anywhere in the world. Uh, that Rachel Pie is easily created by anyone for about $70. And that's including. That, that the RPI, Rachel Pie, which is $70, we say is good for six and 10 simultaneous users. The six is when you're doing this type of stuff where it's interactive exercises. The 10 is when you're doing more general web browsing. Um, that number can be enhanced by plugging that into a router or an existing network. Uh, and then you can get up to about 14 or 15 people accessing this. The larger units that are floating around, Intel claims 50 users. Uh, we've got to about 16 doing this type of work uh, and about 35 doing regular static HTML web browsing. Yeah. Yes. So we offer the SD cards free to download, pre-compiled with all of the content on them and the operating system. So you just plug it into a Raspberry Pi and it works. Um, you can go off and add a set, like an external storage. And then you can go to our library of offline sites. And we have a couple terabytes of sites you can choose from. You could download them all and you could put them on an external hard drive. And then you can just, you, you have to do a, a slight technical of uh, repointing of the web server, but there's instructions on our website about how to do that, that type of activity. So um, this actually runs on in Nginx, and then Apache runs almost all of the other static. There's two web servers running at the same time. Um, and actually, I take that back. This runs Light TPD and Nginx. The other one runs Apache, the, the larger, more powerful device. Um, but all the instructions are online. You can go and you can run a script and build it yourself if you don't want to download one of our pre-compiled SD images, or you can just download one of our images and plug it into a Pi and you're done with it. Uh, Worldpossible.org is probably your best starting spot. Uh, and then from there it gets confusing, but I got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we do Rachel Pi in English, Spanish, French, and Hindi. Um, we do all of that same content Build your, build your own versions on the Intel device, um, which hasn't really had a commercial presence yet. It's hard to go buy that device a lot of places. Um, but if you get that device from us, you can log in and you can choose your languages and then you can download all the new, it'll download all the new content for you. Uh, yeah, it's produced by a company called Gemtech and we have to buy them by the thousand at this point. So. Um, we'll see how that, that goes. You know, we're, we're hoping that there's a larger community around that device. It's the right device to use. It's, it's a very secure, it's very well put together, it's got a nice battery, and it works for, for quite a long period of time. Um, any other questions on this stuff? Um, I don't think we get great sound out here, and this is uh, a little more of the international development side. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about World Possible, what World Possible does, if that's of interest. But I might take a little break and let people leave. It's a very, <laughs> is that Daniel? Hey, Daniel. Daniel interned with us for a while, a couple years ago. Uh, so it's good to see him. Um, and I'll get a little bit into what we do now. We now actually employ people in the, in the developing world to teach this type of technology, to teach blended learning technologies in their own communities. So uh, we now have seven what we call social entrepreneurs around the world. There are two in Guatemala, there are two in Sierra Leone, there are two in Namibia, and there's one in Kenya. Um, beyond that, we obviously make all of our technology freely available to anyone who wants it. So we now know of Rachel in about 41 countries that have reported back and are using it all the way from single schools to um, ministries of education uh, in Namibia. It's now like a, a state-sponsored program to put these into all of the libraries and community centers in Namibia. Um, so a lot of what this, this video would talk about if we had sound is, is the effect that this has on the community about giving kids an opportunity to learn where they otherwise wouldn't. 
Um, you know, he talks about keeping kids in the villages and in the towns where they used to have to come to the city if they wanted any sort of educational opportunity. Now they've got something to keep idle hands busy to get them excited about coming to school. We work with a company called BRCK or Brick, which develops now a Keo kit, which is 40 tablets, Wi-Fi charging into one giant case. All you have to do is slide them in their slots. All the kits get charged and all the kids have access to Rachel. It's a Kenyan company that's um, selling this as an actual product and they've sold about 73 of them is what I understand, which is full classroom kits. It's $5,000. It teaches 40 kids at once. Uh, it's a very, very cool project that's been happening that's spun out from a lot of our Rachel content. So uh, we've been excited to see that happen. A lot of what's changed, um, Rachel was actually built in 2008 by a team of Cisco developers. Back in the day it was a large NAS device, uh, which I've gained in popularity now, but for a while it was like kind of a funky tech thing that we tried to get other people to use. It was power hungry, it was difficult to maintain, it was costly. Um, and so from 2008 to 2011, we basically died as an organization. There wasn't anyone using what we were doing. Um, since then, we've had three massive changes which have made this become what's kind of become a successful project. Um, you know, first we have open content in the Creative Commons, so now we know without licensing restrictions, what we can use, what we can take, and that movement has created a lot more high quality educational materials for people. Uh, the second thing that's happened is the proliferation of low cost computing hardware. Now it's almost cheaper to take a kid a tablet than it is to take him a textbook. Uh, coupled with our server opportunities, you can now bring a full library of educational and health related activities for pretty much under $5,000 for a classroom of 40, which is just uh, really incredible from where we were three or four years ago. Uh, and then the last thing is that we've had great advances in web browser technology and HTML5 standards. You know, before when we were talking about taking Britannica to a community, you needed to know what operating system they were running, whether the disk was going to be compatible. And now with running everything through HTML5, we know that, that we've got a set standard that we can develop to that's going to work um, on the variety of devices and operating systems that get donated or bought for the developing world. Um, so like I mentioned, we sell these on our website. Uh, we also give you all the instructions to build them and do them on yourself. We sell Rachel Pie for $115. We sell a USB preloaded with content, our content library, as well as uh, Windows uh, Apache MySQL PHP pre-configured. So you can just plug this into a Windows machine, turn it on, and that Windows machine will become a server for our community as well. Uh, and we sell those for 20 bucks also. This is what our um, development site looks like. And so we rely on a lot of volunteers to package content for offline use. So what we have learned over time is that you can't just give people a general set of content. You've got to find what's relevant for people. And so people are limited by storage or limited by bandwidth. We have a large library of content you can go see. It's at um, dev.worldpossible.org. These are all of the different sets of content. They're sortable by language. They're sortable by uh, age range. They're sortable by category. Um, and you can download any one of these individually, or you can download the package as a whole, or if you find out that your kids are only using CK12 textbooks, you can download just the updates to CK12. It's all compatible with rsync on any of our servers, um, as well as FTP download and just straight zip file HTTP downloads. Any other questions? Um, yes, maybe. I just made this slide this morning, so no. But <laughs> I think that they just took a copy of the presentation and they'll put it up somewhere. Um, then, you know, what we come here for a lot of times is to get help with a lot of the development side of this. You know, we're working on a captive portal for this, and when you connect, it automatically, automatically grabs you and takes you to um, the full set of content. Last month, I just pulled this our website in terms of people downloading content, which many people replicate many times. We went through just under seven terabytes of content last month, uh, which made us have more bandwidth than the actual raspberrypi.org who hosts us for free. Uh, but that's the equivalent of a few hundred downloads of our content in its entirety. So it's, um, it's gaining traction. This is up uh, just over 100% since about six months ago when we were doing three terabytes. And about a year and a half ago, we were doing somewhere between 300 and 400 gigabytes of traffic. So. No, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has, has just upped our server. They've been fantastic. They support us financially and through this, but it's been uh, uh, really great for us. In the bottom left, we still use a lot of Google Docs. We find that people are, are more comfortable commenting and questioning on those. So if you try to build any of these and you have a question, you just type it into the Google Doc, and, and then away we go. 
Um, at any point in time, we have anywhere from, I think, this picture was from earlier today, we had nine people online looking how to build a Rachel Pie. Sometimes it goes up to 20, sometimes it goes down to three, but it's uh, become a nice little community of people helping each other out. We also recently put all of our code on GitHub, um, and that's been great for getting new contributions for people to help us build the technology side. So we want kids to have a little storage locker on one of our little servers. You know, that installing that, installing updates to Wikipedia, installing automatic updates of content when you plug in. These are all things that are getting work done right now as part of the larger community that we're hoping to see uh, made freely available to anyone else who wants them or can use them. Uh, the next thing that we've just added is, is a new pretty cool thing called uh, Weaved. I don't know if anyone has heard of this, but it just gives us a very easy remote connectivity into these devices. So this is only on our Intel device because it's uh, a bit processor intensive for us to be doing this. Um, we also pay for subscriptions out of donations, but what this does is allows us, whenever any one of these devices gets plugged in, whether it's in Namibia and you take it to the city center in Windhoek, uh, or it's in the prison system, they can come plug them into the internet. We get alerted that device is plugged in. We can go and we can check on content that needs to be updated. We can now pre-stage content. So the Department of Juvenile Justice in Oregon has a new pamphlet they want to send out about um, educational opportunities when you leave the facilities. All of these facilities are totally offline. Over time, they'll plug them in. They'll get connected to Weaved, and they will get that new download. And the next time they bring it back into the facility, they'll know that this is now available. It'll show on the home page you have new content. Um, and so Weaved has enabled us to view these devices anywhere in the world if they get connected to Internet through any source. So it requires um, no port forwarding. It can build its own firewalls. It's very secure. And they've helped us build this management portal where we can now manage large sets of devices. So. If you get a device from us, you can tell us it's going to East Africa, and then when we update our farming package in East Africa, the next time your device comes online, it will get that new content. So a lot of our devices come online like never. A few of our devices now with this type of technology are coming online about every other week. You know, you'll see that there becomes patterns with how often people are plugging it in, and a lot of that has to do with how frequently we're updating content. But what this also will do when we do larger deployments is allow people to manage their own sets of content. So uh, we're working with UMCOM, which is a religious organization that wants to be able to send out messages because they're putting these in all of their um, like mission locations. And so they can send out new like, scriptures or pastures or whatever they want to load up whenever their devices get plugged in. It's very easy for them. It's like a Dropbox functionality. They can just add little pages. Whenever someone plugs in the device, it downloads the content that's destined for their device. So. This is something we've done over the last few weeks, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a little bit of where we're going with this project as a whole. Now, the problem with that is we get these devices into very remote locations, and do you want to trust someone to take it from a refugee camp uh, into the city center and get it updated with Internet? And a lot of times the answer is no. You want this locked up somewhere. You don't want to be handing this off to people, and you don't want to require them to go and plug it in. Um, so what we're working on next is actually a uh, disruption te tolerant networking system that allows anyone with an Android device who knows that there needs to be, uh, and this is an actual use case, we're in a refugee camp in South Sudan. They need lists of where people are living and those get updated every week. For us to take our device into town to go get that list and then bring it back doesn't make a lot of sense. But what we can, or we're working on doing now is you can email a device. That email will sit in the cloud until anyone with an Android device can actually download that email and go deliver it to this Wi-Fi hotspot. So you can have an application that you can turn on your phone. You can see where there are Rachels are around you if you have Internet access. You can see how much content needs to go to those particular devices. You can download that content for them. You can walk up to their Rachel Wi-Fi hotspot, and as soon as you connect to their Wi-Fi, it will offload their content for them. And so we'll, we'll be counting on the community itself to go out and actually deliver this type of, yeah. Sorry. No. Very, it, it's early. Um, there's a Professor Yonecki out of Cambridge who just does this, and she reached out to us through the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and they're going to do it as a school project. Um, so it's supposed to start in the next school cycle for her, which starts six months from now. But we've talked through it, and it's, it's what we're, we're looking for is the next step in what our evolution has been from a technical side. Um, that's pretty much it. That's, this is a, a graph of you know, where we're most centrally located. Um, we've built content in a way that it's specific for sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa, West Africa, so you'll see clusters uh, in areas where we've been able to find locally specific content. And a lot of that 
gets back to what World Possible does in our social entrepreneur program, um, which I think is like the second half of this presentation. But this second half is like totally non-technical and totally about like what World Possible does as a as a charity. So I understand that this isn't always the audience for that. So if people have questions about the technology um, or any of that, I'd love to answer them now. And um, if people want to hear about this, I'm, I'm more than happy to get into how we how we do what we do. Yes. Yes. So Rachel Pies right now have a uh, a script that you would have to you'd have to know how to SSH into a Rachel Pie. We don't include Weaved on the Rachel Pie, and it'll have a script and it'll read all of your content folders. It'll ping back to our server via rsync and it'll grab all of the changes from the content that you have now. This is more automatic. We just started doing the Weaved process. Um, Weave charges us a dollar a device a year and we haven't figured out how we want to deal with that type of payment structure or whatever. So we, we get a free, they give us a free hundred. And we are dealing with this right now where we are preloading sets of content in Oregon and East Africa. Um, and we're dealing with, we're, we haven't figured that out. We're not a business. You know, we became a little bit of a social enterprise when we started selling this product in February. Um, but we really didn't expect that to happen. There was people, we wanted to create a, an easier process for people to do this and we needed better hardware. Um, and so we, we had to buy it, and we've had to sell it, and it's, it's um, gone well, but it's opened a lot of doors we weren't expecting. So. We're a 501c3, 100% of the profits roll back into the project. Um, I'm our only full-time employee in the U.S. I became a full-time employee about 18 months ago, and then we have seven full-time employees as social. Los Angeles, here, yeah. Yeah, you Yes, yes. Um, and the, the Intel device is nice. It has like a teacher portal, so teachers have their own login. They can add all of their content for the year, and then as they go, they can star content. And when they star it, it becomes viewable by all of the students. So when a student logs in, they go to their, their learning section, and they know what is now viewable, which wasn't before. So a teacher only has to load all of their worksheets, all of their tests, all of their exams once, and then her job is to go through and just click when she wants to make these available to the student. Um, and that's something that we're doing more in the prisons, and we know what happens with it overseas. We really don't know what. That's one of our biggest challenges is getting data back from what we're doing. We don't always know, so um, we go on faith sometimes. No, we have quite a few people uh, in Ghana, and that's a it's a bit of a dated map too, but. Uh, uh, you can have one of these. <laughs> um, we we do offer a what we call a rugged pie, uh, which we do put a internal UPS in in an hour battery life. Um, the micro SD card on these devices lasts about six months in environments where power goes out all the time. It's not it's, a micro SD card isn't designed to be a hard drive. It's not designed to have this so. We do offer one, we call it the Rugged Pie. We do put a UPS inside it. It does automatically switch over to battery whenever power goes out in a village. It can run by itself for an hour, and then when battery gets down, it properly shuts itself down, or you could, it has a button on top of it. You can turn it on and turn it off. Um, we charge, I think, $149 for that, and that's uh, the exact cost on top of whatever it normally costs to build one of those things. We really encourage people to do it right if they're going to do it. So. We don't want to make anything cost prohibitive from that standpoint. Right. I mean, you get usually a lot of these times you get one chance to do it right. You know, you, you take these things and you do it wrong. You don't you don't go back and do it again. So. Um, yeah, five, and we've had it run up to about eight and a half without a lot of activity. It's kind of five hours of, of more heavy use. Yeah. Well, the board is made by a guy out of Germany. We get it through, it's called piemodules.com, um, and they're like $19 for the board, and then we sourced our own batteries so that they would last for an hour, because that would get kids through a class session, uh, which is really what we were, we were hoping to do.
Yeah, so the, the Rachel Pi via Wi-Fi, we say is good for six to ten users, depending on what they're doing. Um, six users, if you're trying to do exercises, are all simultaneously watch video. And actually the biggest limiting factor on the Rachel Pi, um, first is that little Wi-Fi dongle. So a lot of people plug these into a router. Uh, the next limiting factor is the I.O. read speed with your micro SD card. That will top out at about 11 megabytes a second with a really good card and about 6 megabytes a second with most normal cards. Um, so when you start dividing that by the number of users, you start understanding the type of experience you get trying to stream a video at 500 kilobytes a second. So um, if kids are just browsing web pages, you can do about 10 to 12 users pretty, pretty okay. You won't really notice any lag or anything like that. Rachel Plus is still new for us. We've gotten one field report back on, on how many people are actually using it at once. 35 people connected, no problem, viewing static HTML with the full classroom. Uh, when they went to do KA Lite, which is one of like the key pieces of this, the actual interactive learning exercises, they topped out at about eight. Um, and we think that's more of a KA Lite thing right now. So we're working with them to kind of enhance some of their actual, you know, it's a Python coded program and we're working with them to get some more speed out of that. But it's another open source project out of San Diego. It's a great group of guys that are doing some really impressive work. Uh, anything else? So we started doing this and we would get these all over the world and we'd get them all over and people weren't using them. Um, and we were trying to figure out why and a lot of it came to I think the second half of why people don't use the internet. And this is like a good time for people to leave if they don't want, I'm not like at all offended by that either. <laughs> but we do run um, what now is considered the world possible chapter model um, and we support social entrepreneurs in a two and a half year program training them on this technology and then getting them to build their own businesses, both selling and distributing this, as well as selling training services in countries, and then advocating to governments for large-scale adoption of this tool. Um, it's a, a two-and-a-half-year program. Right now our chapters exist in Guatemala, uh, Namibia, Sierra Leone, and Kenya. Guatemala was our first chapter, so I'll probably talk about that a little more. It's two-and-a-half years old now. Uh, to give you the highlight, it's totally self-sustainable. We supported one social entrepreneur for two and a half years. Uh, he has now raised $74,000 for 2016 for his work in Guatemala. And then he covers all of his own expenses out of selling these Rachel Pi units and teaching training courses uh, to, on how to use both Rachel Pi as a technical tool and then learning methodologies around how to use this in the classroom. Um, but all of our programs are totally locally owned. There's no U.S. or uh, foreign staff monitoring anyone. Um, we have volunteers that do day-to-day -day monitoring because we do provide financial contributions to each of our social entrepreneurs. Um, so we have a lot of Rotarians have signed up for this role of day-to-day of -day monitoring. They go onto WhatsApp, they talk to them, they see what they're doing, they make sure that school actually exists. They make sure that they talk to the teacher and make sure that this person was actually there. They ask them how the hardware and technology is going. Um, and then we give our social entrepreneurs a set of kind of five, six month commitments where we are asking them to do different things over each of the six months and if they do that they kind of move on to the next part of our, our program. Um, we also do provide technical support uh, from our pool of volunteers so if anyone gets a kick out of this as a good networker or something like that, you know, we can sign you up and anytime we get a request out of Ghana it would go to you. Um, right now those all go to Seth. We have a great guy who takes all of our requests, requests from West, West Africa for help. But we are getting more and more of those and we more and more want to be providing support or connecting people to people who do want to help in this regard. Um, so it's a five, six month block. The first uh, six months we don't provide them any financial money but we do provide them hardware. And so this is long after we've identified a social entrepreneur which is probably the hardest part of what we do. But we get a lot of feedback from people saying, I've been using this in my community for years. I've you know, heard of you guys. I really think this could be important. And we tell them, good, good luck. And then we wait to hear from them again. And we wait to hear from them again. And then eventually we provide them with some amount of hardware with no promise of any, anything more than that. And we see what they do over the six-month period. The how many people can you go reach? You know, what kind of impact are you having? What connections to the community do you have? You know, do you know the right people? If they get through that six months, and this is actually it goes on to recruiting, and then we actually ask them to localize the content. So we have Rachel Pie just for Guatemala. While we have a Spanish version on our website, we have a Guatemala-specific package that we distribute in Guatemala. We have Rachel Kenya, which is actually an East African package, but that has more Swahili content. It is curated just for this particular market, and we rely on our social entrepreneurs during that phase to do that. 
Once they've done that and we've created a local country specific package, we redistribute what we have. You know, we go out there and we say, this is what we've built for you. Let's, let's see it in action. And then the last six months, we give them six months to go out and fundraise and create a business out of what they're doing. So again, this is first uh, stage. This is pretty much, uh, this is about four months ago where we were in Namibia. And actually, it's probably a, a little longer than that now. And Namibia is a year and a half into our program. But this was part of his original, you know, I'm showing you there are people who need this, and this is the kind of work I'm doing. It's one of my favorite pictures uh, we've ever got. But he set up a community outreach center with Rachel in it and would bring in villagers, and he'd ask them about health problems, and he would show them how they could research their symptoms on Rachel and what that really meant. Uh, so that the, the next part of our program is after you've gone out, you've met with somewhere between two and 3,000 people during that six-month period. We're asking you to recruit a group of about 10 to 14 individuals who will help localize the content. So those are almost always teachers. They're almost always a diverse set of teachers. They're all tech-savvy people. They're really the, what we're hoping for is the best 10 to 14 people that we've gotten um, out of the thousands that they've gone and met. So this is a six-month process to recruit our working group. That working group we're going to take in the localized section. We actually pay that whole working group to sit down on weekends. In Guatemala, they came from all over the country. We paid all of their travel expenses. Every other weekend, they came together for four and a half months to build the right set of content for the schools in Guatemala. So the second page is going out there. And this is Bonfus. He's our social entrepreneur. He's wearing the Rachel polo. And this was at the end of his recruitment phase. He was saying, OK, I need 10 to 14 people to help me. And this is the response he got in Soy, which was in southwest Kenya. It's pretty cool. Um, we also, this is our social entrepreneur in Guatemala. He was speaking at TEDx uh, in Guatemala. You know, this is their job right now, is to go out and find the right people who can help with this project. So third is localizing the content. And this is where it really uh, depends on our social entrepreneurs to figure out what localizes local people. So in Kenya, what, what localizes people in Kenya is totally different than what, lo what, what incentivizes people in Kenya is totally different than what incentivizes people in Guatemala. Kenya has a rigid school system. They have a curriculum that they teach you. They have exams that they have to pass. Guatemala has none of that. Guatemala is looking for agriculture. They're looking for English language learning. Those are all things that we don't know, but we count on our social entrepreneurs and those 10 to 13 people to come together and say, this is what's going to be important for us. In Mexico, it was SATs and, again, language learning. But it's a different type of language learning. In Guatemala, they were trying to learn English so they could study. In Mexico, they were trying to learn English for vocational trades. So even then, it's a, it's a different set of what do we really need for this set of people. So we're not overwhelming them with content. We're giving them something that makes sense for them to go through and actually learn in their respective environments. So we figure out what incentivizes people. Um, we almost always create or find curriculum and pacing guides where they exist. Uh, you know, Our first entry point in a lot of places is teachers. So if we can tell them what they're supposed to be teaching on a particular day and then give them resources on Rachel to help them teach, that's great. Uh, we look for local content and local language. So we have a lot of Mayan content in Guatemala that they've collected and put onto uh, our Rachel Pie for Guatemala. Um, a lot of what we found incentivizing people is also some of the preservation of their cultural histories. So in Guatemala, they've used this as a tool for storing audio tours. Um, and they will go and they'll have all the kids go and interview a local village elder in their na native Mayan language. They'll hear old native stories. They'll load this onto their Rachel Pie where they can all upload content, and it'll be a place for them to share local stories. And for them, it's a place for them to preserve local culture. And eventually, our hope is to get all of this stuff back online. Um, another thing, you know, what incentivizes uh, particular groups? We've talked about health. We've worked with uh, Doctors Without Borders groups. We've talked about religion. We work with UMCOM. There's a lot of different things that incentivizes people to pick up those projects. We need to just find those. When we find the incentives, we say, what content already exists that we can add? That's the easiest way to add content that already exists. When it doesn't exist, what content can we get created? So in Guatemala, we needed a lot of vocational training about how to build a chair, how to build a desk. Uh, we went to the uh, University of Guatemala. They created a course on creating videos for people who need this kind of stuff. And so it was very basic um, farming and agriculture. There's this great content that we have on building an irrigation drip garden out of old um, plastic bottles. And it teaches kids how to cut out the bottom of the bottle and how to build a drip irrigation system where you have limited water and limited resources. Um, and it's actually it's happening. It's a school project that happens in a lot of our northern Guatemala cities. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And then the last thing we do is how can we align our existing content in a more useful way? And so that's really where we start sitting down with those 11 to 14 teachers. And we say, if this is what you're supposed to be teaching, 
how can we put our content together in a way that makes sense for you to actually use this as an end user? Um, and so a lot of that is just aligning content that exists on Rachel that we found or created to the local curriculum. In vocational training, it's a different way. You know, what makes, does it make sense to learn how to build a desk before you know how to screw in a screw? You know, it's just a really a matter of creating a simple way for people to learn. And let me see. Sorry. Um, so this is one of those. This is in Guatemala. This is a Rotarian who was hosting those biweekly meetings to uh, align Guatemalan content to the local curriculum there. Uh, and this is some of what comes out of it. Um, CNB is the National Curriculum of Guatemala. In Kenya, we actually built a package called Rachel Shamba, which is a four gigabyte package. Um, it comes on a micro SD card that people plug into tablets. And this is used almost entirely by um, a group whose job it is to take farm products from the city center out to farms. They're the basically material salesmen. And so when they go out there, they're going out to a farm, and they, the farmer says, I have a, a leaf, and it looks like this, and it's killing all my plants. You know, it's got this white fuzz on it, and it's got these holes in it. And this is just a package of East African farming materials where he can say, you know, this is the bug that's causing that. I can show you on my tablet without the need for Internet exactly what's causing that. This is written on the website. This is what you need, and I can get you that product. And so for them, it's become a way to enhance their livelihoods, both and from a farming community standpoint and from the guy whose job it is is to actually sell product. Um, this is, uh, Facebook did a video on our social entrepreneur in Guatemala. It's a cool video. It's on our website somewhere. Uh, you guys can check it out later if you want. Uh, the last really uh, community benefit part that they do is this force distribute again. So this is almost two years into the program. We have built a local content specific package for Guatemala or for Kenya or for whatever it is that we're doing. And we talk about distribute with a purpose or intent to engage. So that first time we're distributing, trying to meet 3,000 people, the sole purpose of that is not to introduce them to this technology and convince them to use it. It's to find people who are going to be the real advocates during our localization process. Once we've built this, we want to go out and say, this is the tool you should be using. And so we've reached this phase uh, with Guatemala and we're getting there with Kenya now. And what we do is we go out and we teach learning methodologies for this. We have now a, a set of content that works. We've got a device that works. And we've got to go out and so we teach souls, which are self-organized learning environments. We teach vocational training. We teach directed learning, which tells kids, this is the math you need to learn. Go and learn this math. Here's how you do it. We teach inquiry-based learning, which is kids have a question. Let's go research a question. Let's talk about using Wikipedia to research. Let's research Guatemalan his history. We talk about blended learning, which is a combination of the two, where you might have some kids learning a process online and then teaching that same process to the other students in the school. We narrow our focus to a manageable set of deployments, and this is our social entrepreneur doing this work. We ask them to cover about 30 deployments, which enables them to visit each deployment once a month. They can share best practices. They can help fix some of the tech problems that do exist. They're really a, a jack of all trades. What more content we can, can we continue to get created and then uh, how can we align that content again in a more useful way? It's a complete iterative process. We view it all as a cycle. So this is teaching in a Guatemalan school translated in Spanish, Shugata Mitre's um, soul, self-organized learning environments, which encourage kids to explore on their own and talk about what they've learned in, in the classroom setting. Um, this is another video that's on our website. This is really much more of like a directed learning, and he is telling kids, go and just learn. Go, tell, go spend five minutes looking at Rachel, tell me about what you found, let's talk about what you found, and this is a way to get kids, really our goal is to get them familiar with the computer. You know, whether or not they're learning is, is of less consequence to me than if they're gaining computer literacy. Our, our main mission has been computer literacy and getting people prepared for jobs in, in the 21st century. So anytime we can get the classroom focused on computers, we're happy. Uh, this is that drip irrigation system with some of the plastic bottles being built in Guatemala. On the right side, that's the Oregon Youth Authority um, when they powered up their first Rachel server September 15th. Uh, and so we're now in every youth facility there. This was in Sierra Leone. Um, we hired our social entrepreneur uh, just before the Ebola crisis. And so that was when they were supposed to be out meeting between two and 3,000 people. Um, that didn't work. Obviously, you couldn't be traveling the country pitching this. So we partnered with a group called Cause Canada who actually taught classes in the north of Sierra Leone, but their teachers couldn't go back to Sierra Leone. They were Canadian teachers. So 
they took our students, our social entrepreneurs, with their students, they paired them together and they said, okay, we're going to try and do school just through Rachel. And so our guys were there to teach the kids how to get on the computers and how to learn math and how to go through the Rachel content. And that was their entire learning during the Ebola crisis. And it was three schools in the, the north of Sierra Leone. On September 2nd, the update that we got from our Facebook page um, is there on the left. And I don't want to slaughter, but it says, the kids in Sukunya extend their sincere thanks to Cause Canada and World Possible. Through the, Rachel, through the use of Rachel contents in the subject areas, we are proud to announce that guys that you guys at Sakunya School came second in the basic certification examination for the whole of the north of Sierra Leone. It was the highest scores they'd ever gotten passing their proficiency exams at the end of the year. And this was with no teachers in the north of Sierra Leone. It was pretty incredible. Um, this thing gets mad when I stay on a slide too long. Okay. Uh, that's what it looked like in Sierra Leone. You had younger kids teaching or learning from older kids. You had all of the kids sharing about three kids to a computer at once going through their math exams. Uh, most of that was through the Foundation for Learning Equality, which will tell you when kids are struggling, you can pair them up with kids that are doing well. With kids that are struggling, you can sort by a subject. You can sort by Algebra 1. You can see all your kids. You can see which kids were proficient in the subject and how long it took them to do it and which kids were struggling. And you can sit them next to each other and you can have them teach themselves. I'm not saying that this success happens all the time, but this is a very cool story for us. Um, and then the last part of what we do is we give our social entrepreneurs a final six months, which is we've only done this in Guatemala now, and he was completely successful to say, you need to build something that doesn't rely on us funding you to do this anymore. And so um, in Guatemala, he raised $74,000. He does about $9,000 in revenue and about $3,000 in profit right now. He's hired a second employee to be now the second social entrepreneur, and we have withdrawn all of our financial commitment to them completely. So we no longer provide any money to our Guatemalan staff. Uh, they run Mundo Posible Guatemala. They just met with the vice president of Guatemala about two and a half weeks ago in a presentation to the new minister of education, uh, and they are pushing for this to be in every school in Guatemala. I mean, they're just totally incredible people doing this on their own. And, and really have set a very high bar for the rest of our social entrepreneurs. But it's, uh, it's been fun. So I think that's pretty much what we've got. I appreciate you guys sitting through the fun part for me in the second half. Thanks. Do we have any questions? No. We, um, so the only um, interactive, are you talking about for our social entrepreneurs or for people who are using our device? Yeah, so we don't do any of the curriculum design ourselves. Um, like in Kenya where you were teaching towards their A exams, which helped them get to the next level of school, we align our content to what Kenya says you need to know. So part of that process of localizing our content is finding out what they say you're going to be tested on and then aligning really just a list of links that say, you know, how we teach math is totally different than how they teach math. We teach Algebra 1, then Algebra 2, and they might do trigonometry and then geometry. So it's a matter of saying this is how you should learn it in the order you should learn it if you're going to take these exams. But we don't do any, like, curriculum design ourselves. All we do is align what content we can find or have or create to what they say you should learn. Anything else? We have um, three, right. We have three sets of content that we um, deploy that aren't available on our site. Um, one is for the Oregon Youth Authority. They have a um, proprietary or paid license program that teaches kids um, all about the educational opportunities in Oregon. So they can learn about the jobs and the curriculum they need and what schools. And Oregon pays $3,000 a year for that. As part of them piloting this and being our advocates, we put that offline for them. Um, in Sierra Leone, we have a literacy program. Uh, it's actually learntoread.org. They charge $500 um, for a school license, and we charged uh, Cause Canada 
paid for the, the work in taking that package offline, which we normally don't do, and then Cause Canada paid that content producer for their server licenses, so we bought three of those. Um, and there's one other package that we have that's uh, not Creative Commons license that, that's passing my mind. Oh, uh, GCF Learn Free, produced by the Goodwill Community Foundation, teaches basic computer literacy courses. For about two and a half years, they would not let us include it. Um, and then when we moved into the prison system, they, they changed their mind. But that's the other package that's not Creative Commons licensed that we include. Yeah, that's a good it's a really good one. Have have and we, we asked for it and we were denied. So we asked for it and we asked for it again and we asked for it again. And finally, uh, about six months ago, they, they said we can now, they believe that we're really, you know, have a nonprofit mission and they're on board for, for including that package. So that's Yeah, so we are in um, we are in the public housing authority in Austin, Texas. We're in 13 state juvenile justice systems. We're in two uh, adult correctional systems. Um, in Detroit, there is a mesh network that provides racial access. Over some hacker group did it. It's pretty cool. Um, we're in a couple of uh, these. I'm blanking on the name, but it's um, a in San Francisco, there's a group that takes returned felons and gives them jobs and arrest. Delancey Street Foundation. Um, so Delancey Street Foundation has a, a few chapters now, and they don't provide internet access to uh, the people who are working there, but they do provide Rachel access through a server there. Um, and I think that's pretty much it in terms of, of known U.S. deployments. Yeah. Yeah, the, the prisons are very tough, uh, and, and a lot of that is like what they call IS, and I think that's internal security, and so they, we've had to send a lot of um, devices out to those people, and it takes them somewhere between six and eight months sometimes to come back. We do run on that Intel device, what we call Rachel Justice, uh, which doesn't include all of Wikipedia, because if you include all of Wikipedia, they can find boobs and bombs and that kind of, they, they actually found all that stuff in Oregon. So that's how we, <laughs> we quality controlled that. Um, there's also, well, we, we took out the full Wikipedia, and then there's a, a package called Wikipedia for Schools, which is done by a UK charity that already filters all of that out. We also had to pull all of the health-related content, um, both because a lot of it had like diagrams, but also because prisoners were self-diagnosing themselves, and that created a whole host of other problems, because if they think they have a condition, they think you have to investigate it on some level. Um, so we, we do have Rachel Justice, which is a package just designed for the prison system. Yeah, but then there's the whole other hardware side of things that you have to get through also. Um, the one, we were at Raybrook Federal uh, in New York, and they wouldn't allow us to do any of the wireless communication whatsoever. They also provide very limited access to actual hardware, but they have uh, CCTV, and so they started broadcasting a lot of the con videos on a schedule so people could learn like particular classes. So you could turn to channel 13 and you knew that math lectures were gonna be happening on a loop. Uh, but that's, you know, that's even a win to get that kind of stuff in, in the federal system. It's a much, much more difficult uh, process than, than in the states or the regions within states. Yeah. Yeah. And so the juvenile system actually has school districts, which I had no idea until I started doing this. Yeah. That they've got teachers and school districts and principals and yeah, it's why I mean there are a lot of incarcerated people in this world. It's it's horrible. I mean it it well, that's a different topic. Yeah. So we worked a lot with Oregon, the Oregon Youth Authority. They piloted this program, and they said about three weeks in, like, this stuff has got to go. So we didn't try and pitch this to the Oregon, to any other prison facilities. Oregon has made public the work they're doing, and we've gotten inbound requests, and everyone has said, give us what Oregon got. So we went through that same process of localizing the content before we went out to that next process of broadly distributing. So we had already kind of created a package for the prisons before it got into the other systems. So it was just an Oregon problem. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. Of all of my resources. I started the MOOC six years ago. Yeah. And I have a, a big database of all the various different uh, channels that have French, Congo, Arabic, and all that uh, when I was starting my MOOC. And so uh, I worked with them in Congo developing for the Lutheran University or something like that. One of the universities that they were going to do a two terabyte drive. Yeah. And then I also worked with another NGO out of Angola. Okay. Yeah. So we've got these big databases of all the various different university material that, um, you know, is taught lecture style. We love that stuff. Yeah. yeah we and love it. Uh, uh, I aligned 180 of our courses with credit by examination. So one guy got his bachelor's in six months from the state region accredited state school. Um, is that through, like, Excelsior College that was doing the credit uh, by exam? Charter, uh, no, Thomas Edison. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to talk a little more about that. That's for the prisons the next you know, step in this is, a, is allowing a lot of credit by examinations, which would allow prisoners to get at, at least an associate's degree while they're inside without access to the internet. So they can have the materials there to study for those courses. Uh, Excelsior College runs all of the credit by examination for the U.S. military, so they're very comfortable with this type of environment where you can learn everything, and if you pass an exam, we will give you college credit. So for, for those people, I, I don't remember, the, when we were at Raybrook, there was part of this presentation, it's like 68% of people who go to jail go back recidivism, and then um, the percentage of, of recidivism among people who obtain a bachelor's degree is like 13%. It's, it's just an astronomical change uh, when people actually get, yeah, so. We uh, we um, we haven't. I mean, we're I mean we're pretty we're pretty lean. <laughs> um, we're pretty responsive to our social entrepreneurs. You know, I'm I'm our staff here, and I feel like I work for them. When they send me stuff, I'm doing I'm just doing support for them right now. Um, we did just get our first large three-year committed grant uh, last Monday, um, so we'll start hiring. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll start hiring a few more people. Uh, we got 750,000. 250,000 a year for the next three years, which is for us double what we've been working on for the last two years. So um, there's there's a pipeline to being a little more proactive about how we, we view this stuff, but it's not here yet. Yeah. Anything else? All right, thanks, Evan.